Omar's preferred um, device, if you can call it that, is the microscope, mine's the telescope, so bear with me. Um, a couple of opening remarks. I'm here from PepsiCo. The perspectives that I want to share with you are very much part of the thinking of the company, but they don't represent an official statement about anything about the future. The future is way too unpredictable for that. And I will also mention a few examples of stuff. And again, there is no official endorsement of any of the examples there, so I just wanted to make that clear. Uh, what I'd like to do in the seven or eight minutes allotted to me is provoke you, I think. And the way I'm going to do that, I'd like to spend a very uh, small amount of time setting up the context. Because what I do best, I think, is help you all ask better questions. You're a fantastic group of people capable of coming up with answers to pretty much anything, I think. But I'm interested if, in the question of if you're asking the right questions. And that applies to big companies, startups, academics just about everyone in the world. Are we asking the right questions is the question I'm most interested in. And then I want to throw out three provocations about the future of food. They're not a classificatory scheme. They're more generative. So there's no expectations of they're mutually exclusive. Of course, they're connected. Everything in the world is connected, I think. So I want to throw out three provocations that hopefully inspire uh, new conversations. So you're looking at something which I think, to me, is a common assumption that these are the battle lines uh, that are being drawn around the future of food. Yeah? Uh, processed versus organic, uh, context effects, you know, how the food is grown, et cetera, et cetera. And I want to propose that maybe the answer is neither when we think about the future of food. So there's all this talk now about whether we couple with nature or we decouple with nature. And I think that's based on a faulty presumption that we're somehow separate from nature in the first place. So I'm interested in kind of a rebalancing aspect of stuff. Can anyone tell me what these people are doing? Food. They're cooking. Yeah, this is, this is the paradigm we operate in, at least in the Western world, I think, when it comes to food. And this interests me, and I'll pair this with another picture, I think. This is our gut. <laughs> very, very different from the pictures that Omar showed us, as reimagined by Mylanta, uh, <laughs> right? And I brought this up because Wendell Berry has a fantastic quote, I think, which sums up the kind of contradiction that we live in and that provides a necessary systemic context for the questions we're all about to ask, which is we have a food system that for the most part doesn't deal with health very well, and we have a health system that doesn't deal with food all that much. And no wonder we're in the soup that we're in. Um, this is an interesting picture to me because it's extremely unrealistic. Uh, especially the guy on the right. So this is, you know, you've all heard the saying, let's think, in, let's think outside the box. You, we're probably in a room where people have heard this a zillion times before. And I want to argue that there is no such thing as thinking outside the box. But we can think in different boxes. Yeah, we can change the box. And since this is a tech event in particular, I wanted to start with a definition of technology that I very much like. It's from Marshall McLuhan. And here is the definition. Each new technology is a reprogramming of our sensory life, and then in turn, a culture. So while you are all immersed in the world of technology, I float above in the world of culture, I think. So I'm really interested in this nexus. So that's all I'm going to say about context. The three provocations that I want to throw out. The first one is, if we adopt a box that says food is information, yeah? Where does that lead us in terms of our thinking, in terms of new ventures, et cetera? A number of you might al already be wearing this hat of thinking of food as information. This is a subject that a lot of you in the room might be familiar with, nutrigenomics. Uh, it's something we're all interested in, in how does food play a role in information that the body receives, the body communicates with the environment. Uh, so this is an interesting aspect, I think, of considering food as information. Uh, is the way we interact with the environment, both in a cultural sense and also in a very highly technical and specific sense. But food as information is not a new thing, right? This is a picture of an apothecary from a 3,000-year-old city in Morocco, Fez. Don't know if any of you have been there. Uh, so food as information was recognized a long time ago, and we can fool ourselves into thinking we're making progress and all these linear narratives around the world's getting better in terms of technology. But we might want to consider ancient wisdom as part of this recipe as well when we're thinking about the future of food. So one of the themes I'm very interested in is the marriage of wisdom from ancient cultures 
uh, Ayurveda being one example, I come from India, with modern science. Instead of this paradigm where we have these two systems of knowledge competing with each other sometimes and all sorts of colonial effects, I'm interested in the integration of these two things. And when we talk about food as information, I don't want to presume that all of the information is in the food. A lot of the information is in the context of food. And here's a very interesting startup from Montreal that's operating in that paradigm of thinking. You've all heard this before, I think, I presume. 90% of taste is smell. So how do you affect the taste of food and how people eat through context devices? There's a lot of information in the context around food consumption as well. So that's another interesting aspect of food is information. I want to move on to a second provocation to say that food is the original social media and always has been, yeah, for, from time immemorial. Um, so what, what kinds of thinking might this lead to? Next Gen Foods is a topic that we're very curious about at PepsiCo. And can you tell me what that garnish is? It's a cocktail, by the way, uh, which I know is sort of an inappropriate thing for a breakfast discussion, but why not? Um, can anyone take a guess at what the garnish is made of for this cocktail? No. <laughs> Good guess there. <laughs> Insects. Yeah. So I'm really curious about all the all the expertise in flavor technology and food chemistry in this room where I work and applying it to entirely new generation of foods or new food substances that are relatively more abundant. So from a system perspective, we don't get into the kinds of fixes we're in now with the drought and the inability to grow certain kinds of crops. So how might we use the same kinds of flavor science and food chemistry that have made Doritos such a loved snack in many parts of the world. And can we apply it to crickets? Can we apply it to ants? Can we apply it to seaweed? These are relatively abundant food sources that may need to be socialized with a lot of expertise in this room to populations that are culturally resistant, right? You talk about seaweed snacks over here, it's like, ah, that's sort of a Korean thing. Or ants and crickets, well, that's sort of a Mexican thing. Well, some of us in this room can help America with that. And lastly, in the, in the social sphere, we are also trying to think of not just food, but eating and drinking as social behaviors and a set of interactions. So this is a picture of a startup that um, is, is growing rapidly, I think, in the US. And there are many more in this realm. Have you heard of Feastly, Eat With? Super Marmite, which started in Paris. And these are all trying to tackle what Sherry Turkle calls the phenomenon of us all being alone together, yeah, if you've read the book. So especially in the new urban environments with a lot of um, young professionals around, the predominant social condition is loneliness. right? And when you talk about food and beverages as social media, what role do they have to play in engineering a different kind of society in terms of bringing to peop people together around food and beverages? So that's another aspect of food as a social media that we're very keen on and interested in. This is Hester Blumenthal, um, a restaurant. This is what he calls experiential seafood. Yeah, So it's molecular gastronomy and lots of seafood stuff. But that, the ubiquitous iPhone earbuds coming out of a conch shell or something, is if you're eating seafood and listening to the sounds of the sea, is your experience of the seafood somewhat different? And you can, it sounds like a trivial thing for a very tech audience, but imagine the applications of, again, sort of a context effect and bringing a sort of experiential quality and how that affects what people eat, how much they eat, uh, what kinds of things do they like and not like. So the surrounding experience becomes a factor in affecting diets and dietary habits and stuff like that. The last uh, provocation I want to throw out is considering food as diplomacy. On many different scales, we can talk about diplomacy as bringing neighborhoods together, as bringing individuals together, and also as bringing entire societies together that are in conflict. This is from a fellow named John Rubin, who I think teaches contextual art at Carnegie Mellon or the University of Pittsburgh. And he started this as a sort of provocation saying, Countries that the US is officially at war with, can we do takeout food from those countries as a way of socializing people to other cultures that you only know through the Department of Defense? Yeah, This is another way to get to know people in the globe. Think about 
diplomacy on a neighborhood level and closed loop systems and what they do for the effects of a community trying to come together. Think of the waste streams that we have in food processing and how they might lead to new substances that are more nutritive, increase shelf life, all sorts of interesting possibilities. Think of a concept that has led to the current paradigm of energy savings, right? Amory Lovins way back throughout this idea of megawatts, the energy that you save. And just by giving it a label, he popularized the concept. Could we do something with mega calories? where the calories that people save become donations in forms of nutritionally dense packets to help with malnutrition elsewhere. And last, I want to leave you with, we have a lot of talk about obesity in the room, but let's remember that all of these are very systemic conditions. So to examine any part of this map, this is a systems map of obesity, by the way. So to examine any sort of individual biology or individual activity is sort of missing the point that it's an interconnected system that's causing all these conditions. And if the 20th century food paradigm was about this, and I'll let you make your own judgments about what this picture represents, I want to argue that maybe the 21st century should look like this. This is Wiki Pearl that came out of this town, I guess, using edible packaging as a way to cut down plastic waste. So I hope this is the future of food, this picture and what the spirit that it embodies. Thank you for indulging me. I'll be happy to take any questions that you have. So do we have any immediate questions for Manoush? Oh. Uh, just a quick question about uh, the food sharing services you mentioned with Feastly and Eat With. How should governments or how should <coughs> companies interact with the legal complications of a new food service? Obviously, Airbnb, hmm. Uber, these sharing economies have had to deal with significant government oversight and just different local regional laws. I was wondering how you think food services is going to interact with uh, the legal um, governments. In the spirit of wondering, I'll wonder with you. I wonder what might happen if we considered uh, there is a big mega trend, if you will, around the decentralization of manufacturing. Right? It's happening in a number of industries. It's going to come to food as well. So I tend to see it as these sorts of uh, activities, you know, social food sharing, as sort of the front edge of the decentralization of food manufacturing. So for big companies like mine, it's, it's hard to, it's not very productive to think of them as a threat, which is one way to look at it. The more helpful way might be to look at them as potential collaborators. So think of them as uh, sort of platforms for the making of food at very local levels. And the company has a role in providing platform help to those people, which is kind of, you know, you think about PepsiCo and beverages, we're a concentrate company. Yeah, we've had, we've owned bottlers, we've divested from bottlers, and the same thing with Coca-Cola. So you can apply the same model to servicing new sorts of platforms. Thank you for the question, it's an interesting one. Excuse me, please wait for the mic. Hi, thank you. Um, when we think about food, or when I think about food, I also think about chemicals, I think about fuels, I think about biofuels, I think about this long discussion about corn, corn sugar, blah, blah, blah. Um, there's a lot of misconception out there about these sort of things, um, primarily hung around the food versus fuel debate. We, if you know anything about it, you realize there is no food versus fuel debate. The stuff that's used to make biofuel is not the stuff that humans eat. Um, Heading a little bit further down that path, does anybody in this room know who the largest consumer of sugar is? U.S. military? <laughs> it's not, not a bad guess. guess. <laughs> but the um, largest purchaser of sugar in the world is Coca-Cola. So I'd be hard pressed for anybody to explain to me how Coca-Cola is food. So since we've got a representative from Pepsi with us today, I'm sure how do you think about sugar? How does PepsiCo think about sugar? Oof. <laughs> we don't think about sugar. Um, I'll refer you back to, I think again, we have to be careful about not honing in on one part of a very systemic problem, right? So when you think about sugar in this country, um, I would take a bit of an argument with the fact that yes, the stuff that we 
the corn that's used for fuel or biofuels is not the same thing people eat, but the land on which it's grown prevents people from growing food on that land. So it's an example of a more systemic problem, I think. So PepsiCo has been trying to reduce sugar. We have very public commitments that you can read about that we've held to for the most part. We're part of industry coalitions that's trying to take sugar out of diets, huge, huge amount of stuff. And a lot of you in the room might be helping us with non-nutritive sweeteners as well. So that, in summary, is sort of our three-pronged approach to dealing with sugar and its effects. And on the note of sugar, I think we're going to have to close this particular uh, interchange. Thank you very much, Manoush. Uh, he is going to be back for, for the panel.